I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab a Bible or take your Bible app and turn to the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 is our text, and uh, as always, if you're uh, in one of our buildings, if you're uh, at our Sweetwater campus, there's Bibles in the seats around you. You can grab one of those, turn to page 1088. If you're at our Parker campus, there's Bibles on the table at the back. Go back there and grab one, turn to page 1088. And as always, if you need a Bible and you don't have one, then take that one with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. And if you're joining us on our online campus and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please just uh, contact us, uh, email us, uh, let our hosts know, and we will get a Bible to you one way or another because we want you to experience God's power in your life through the truth of His Word. So uh, Acts chapter 8 is where we're going to be as we continue our series in Acts. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but for the last seven months, our nation and really our world has desperately been attempting to prevent the spread of COVID. You guys notice that? I mean, it's been kind of obvious, right? I mean, we've had travel bans. They shut everything down. We, you know, they closed churches and schools and sporting events. Uh, I mean, it was just crazy. We've, we've, you know, had social distancing. We've had uh, masks and all of these things to try to prevent the spread of COVID. And can I just tell you that as a nation, as a world, we have failed miserably? I mean, have you guys noticed that? I mean, uh, in the United States, we've had almost 8 million confirmed cases of COVID and over 200,000 deaths attributed to the disease. I would say that we did not contain the spread very well. But it's not just us. I mean, worldwide, there have been over 38 million recorded cases and about a million deaths attributed to the disease. It, you know, we failed to contain the spread of COVID-19. Can we just go ahead and, and, and acknowledge that failure and all the stuff that we've tried to do? You could say, well, it could have been worse, but uh, it, it's as bad as it is. So we didn't, we didn't really succeed at that. Now, since its beginning, and we've acknowledged the beginning of the church, people and nations have been trying to stop the spread of Christianity. I mean, uh, Followers of Jesus have been harassed. Laws have been passed against. Uh, there's been persecution. There's been execution for people who follow Christ. And yet, they've been trying to stop the spread of Christianity. Can I just tell you, they have failed. They have failed miserably. The gospel has spread, and it continues to. I mean, there's case after case after case. Uh, the example is China, okay? Okay. 1949, the communists took over China and they expelled all of the Christian missionaries that were in China. They closed the churches, they banned religion, they said it's against the law, you, you cannot practice, you cannot gather, you cannot worship uh, under fear of imprisonment and death. Uh, at that time, 1949, there were about 700,000 Christians in China. Okay, about 700,000 Christians in China. And, and all those laws are passed, and the government put all of its power against religion. And about 70 years later, you know, today, the communist government recognizes that there are 44 million Christians in China. Yeah. Now, I, I think that's kind of cool. That's 63 times as many as there were when they outlawed religion. You, you like that? But here's the thing. That's the, that's the government's claim. Now, we know they're, they're lowballing it. There are Christian agencies that, that are involved heavily in China, and they say there's probably more like 100 million Christians in China. Even though it's against the law to convert to Christianity, something happened. They failed to stop the spread of the gospel. And uh, by the way, the fastest growing churches in the world today are, are in sub-Saharan Africa and in Muslim countries like Iran. So sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's a place of poverty, hardship, disease, and yet the gospel is spreading. In Muslim countries, uh, like Iran, it's against the law to convert, and it's against the law to gather as a church, and it's punishable by death, and people are turning to Christ in droves. You can't stop the spread of the gospel. The good news that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. 
The good news that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead. The good news that, that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. We'll have their sins forgiven. We'll have heaven as our destiny. That's the gospel. And that's what the world has been trying to prevent the spread of for almost 2,000 years. And they've been failing. Wonderfully. They've been failing. And, and uh, today... We're looking at a passage in Acts that shows us this reality at its very beginning point. Okay, at its very, you know, the, the, the start, the conception of this movement spreading. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at this passage and we're going to see some just incredible life-changing truths out of it. So we're going to pick up Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And uh, we're going to read uh, through verse 8 just to begin. It says, And Saul approved of his execution. Last week, Pastor Robert shared about Stephen, the very first martyr of the Christian church, uh, and he was uh, dragged out of the city because he was preaching Jesus, and he was stoned to death. And, uh, and it says, this is where chapter 8 begins, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Okay, the first thing I want you to see out of this passage is that God redeems tragedies to accomplish his mission. God redeems tragedies to accomplish his mission. Uh, the tragedies are, are apparent. Stephen was martyred, and then there's this persecution that is coming upon the church. People who have been living uh, in community. They've been gathered in Jerusalem. They've been worshiping together, serving together peacefully. Now they're being imprisoned. Uh, their lives are destroyed. Many are being executed. And yet God redeemed. God accomplished his purpose. In spite of the evil of persecution, God was still busy redeeming the lives of men and women. Now, just as a reminder, uh, Jesus had told the apostles Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age, okay? That was, that was the great commission given to them. In Acts chapter 1, we, we talked about this repeatedly. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, that was what Jesus told them. And, uh, and they were being witnesses. At least uh, they were making disciples in Jerusalem and Judea. They kind of ignored the other parts of that. Can, can I just be honest? They had no plans for the ends of the earth, and they were ignoring Samaria for about five to six years. So the church, including the apostles, were being disobedient to Jesus' great commission. Well, you say, well, they were making disciples. Okay, they were just ignoring part of the Great Commission. Let's, let's at least acknowledge they were procrastinating terribly. Because this is five or six years after Jesus' ascension. This is five or six years later, and they haven't gotten past Jerusalem and Judea. And then the persecution happened. Stephen is, is martyred. Saul begins persecuting the church. It's terrible and it's tragic, and yet God redeemed the persecution by using it to spread the gospel and change lives. Because suddenly, they're fleeing Jerusalem, and they end up in Samaria, and they begin preaching. And people begin believing. And God redeems tragedy. And some of you are going, that is nice biblical history, so what? What does that have to do with us, where we are? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever prayed for revival or spiritual awakening in America or your community? Go ahead, let me see your hands. Oh, okay, in this room, a lot of people are raising their hands. How about you at home? You gotta raise your hands too if you're watching this with anybody else, okay? 
So we've done that. How, how many of you want to see God work in amazing ways in Parker and Lake Havasu and wherever you're watching from in your community? How many of you want to see God work in amazing ways? Like your hands all over the room. We want to see God work. We're praying for revival and spiritual awakening. So let me ask you a question. Could it be that God is answering our prayers for spiritual renewal by redeeming the tragedy that we call COVID? Is that possible? Is it possible that God used a pandemic with shutdowns and riots to get the attention of his complacent children? Is it possible that we weren't listening, that we were acting in, in, you know, we were not acting in obedience, and now we're focused on God because millions are ill, thousands are dying, and churches are closed, and suddenly now we're paying attention to God? I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking about all the people who are really upset that they couldn't go to church, but they weren't going to church all the time before. <laughs> and, and we know who we are because, you know, we kind of like, yeah, I can go there anytime. And suddenly they, they shut down and they're like, wait, I want to go to church now. They tell me I can't. See, I think now we're paying attention. And here's the reality that, that we got we to gotta hear this. God is more interested in our obedience than our comfort and our safety. God is more interested in your obedience than in your comfort or your safety. See, the early church suffered tremendous persecution and God redeemed it to take the gospel to new people. Okay, even though they were having a tragedy, God redeemed that tragedy and, and the church was scattered so the gospel spread. So are we suffering sickness and economic hardship so we can get serious about the mission of Jesus? Is that part of God's purpose in this? To redeem this tragedy that way? So here's the problem. And, and this is a problem for me, and I'm guessing it's a problem for you. We pray for God to make it easier. Don't we? God, keep me healthy. Keep my loved ones healthy. Make them well. God, you know, give me a raise, provide for me, you know, let the stock market return and rally, you know, let, uh, you know, just, just give me that, let me win the lottery, okay, God, I'll, I'll, I'll give it away, most of it, some of it, okay, a little bit. Uh, we, we, we pray for God to make it easier for difficult people to, to agree with us and stop, you know, thinking about voting the other way or whatever it is. And we pray for God to make it easier, but God just wants to make us jesus -ier. I know that's not a word. I just made it up. Like it. Forgive me, but it's the only one that rhymed with easier. Uh, <laughs> but, but see, here's the thing. That's, that's the point. We miss the point. We want God to, to, you know, make our lives easy, and God just wants to make us like Jesus. And that doesn't usually happen because everything is easy. See, God is not committed to our comfort. Oh, we want him to be, but he's not. And we know this because Jesus told us, right? If any of you would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. That was on his way to Jerusalem where they'd crucify him, you know? That, that is not about comfort, Self-denial is not comfortable. Taking up your cross is not comfortable. And, and by the way, God is not worried about your physical safety. I know some of you are just shocked right now. Maybe even offended that God, what do you mean God isn't concerned about my physical safety? I pray for traveling mercies and, and uh, pray for this and I want God to heal this. And, and, you know, look, I get that. We all, we all want to be healthy and safe, but God is not committed to our physical safety. I mean, it didn't work so well for Stephen, did it? Didn't it work so well for the early church? I, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just pointing out, you guys do realize that heaven is real, right? You, you do realize that, that our hope is not in this world. Pastor Robert talked about that last week. You might want to like, watch the sermon again if you missed it. And, and the moment that we start thinking that it's all about here and now and just staying safe, we've missed the point. We don't have to worry about the here and now because God has promised us next and next is better. That's why the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 said, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He's basically saying, hey, next chapter is better than this chapter. 
He said it really specifically in Romans chapter 8. Some of you need to like memorize Romans 8, 18, where, where the apostle said, I do not consider this present suffering worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying? Heaven is so much better, you will not care what kind of crap you go through in this world. Okay, because, you know, you're facing it, and you're looking at it, and you're frustrated by it, and you feel like you're overwhelmed by it, and just be reminded that your physical safety is not God's top priority. God desires your obedience. And honestly, a lot of times he answers prayers in ways that we don't really want him to. But he is redeeming our tragedies to accomplish his mission. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. And then... We see that God's life-changing power is for everyone, everywhere. Continue the story, if you will. Uh, Picking up in verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. I like that. He's promoting himself. See, it's not a new thing. There was celebrity culture back then, too. And... uh, And they all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed." Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they freaked out and sent to them, it doesn't say that, but they sent to them Peter and John. You guys realize Peter and John were like the top of the echelon here. So they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Pause right there. This is kind of a crazy account, and so I want to talk about it just for a minute. God's life-changing power is for everyone, everywhere. The people of Samaria were coming to faith in Jesus, even a famous sorcerer, right? So celebrity Christians were there from the beginning. But here's the weird thing. They did not receive the Holy Spirit immediately, and that's always been awkward to me. And it's the only time you find that in uh, any of the passages. And you go, what is wrong with this picture? Why wouldn't the Holy Spirit fall on them right away? Now, the answer is pretty clear once you understand the culture and the setting and what God's trying to do. So let me see if I can explain this to you. The Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans hated Jews. I mean, we're talking about 500 years of enmity between them. This is way worse than Havasu and Kingman. All right? So way deeper than that, because the Jews rightly believed they were God's chosen people. And, and the Samaritans were half-breed Jews that had been, uh, you know, people had been taken away in exile, and others had been brought in, they intermarried, and they kind of made up their own version of Judaism, which wasn't really Judaism. It was kind of a mixture of Judaism and some other stuff. And so the Jews despised the Samaritans, and Samaritans tried to claim that they were the true people, and it's all this, this stuff between them. And, and, you know, way worse than anything we're experiencing politically right now. And, uh, and so these new Christians who were all Jewish were not concerned at all with taking the gospel to the Samaritans. They'd had five years, and we're talking about, they didn't have 60 miles of open desert to cross. We're talking about a line between villages, and they ignored each other. And so basically the Jewish Christians were saying, Jesus loves us, and he's given us eternal life, but you're Samaritans, you can go to hell. That's what they were saying by their actions. We don't care if you don't have eternal life. We don't care if you ever hear about Jesus. So the persecution sent Jewish believers into Samaria. They preached the gospel because some of them were being obedient. And Samaritans believed. And this freaked out the church in Jerusalem. So what did they do? They sent the two most credible leaders they have, Peter and John. You guys go check it out, see if this is really happening. We don't like this Samaritan believing stuff. And, uh, and so they get there, and they prayed for them, and they laid hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came. 
and showed all of the same signs that they had received at Pentecost. And, and this is where it gets really, really weird. Why in the world did God do it that way? And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's simply this. He wanted Peter and John to see that God was visiting salvation on the Samaritans exactly like he did on the Jews. That there's no difference between Jewish salvation and Samaritan salvation, and that was a hard pill for the Jews to swallow. But because Peter and John saw it happen, because he saw the evidence of the Holy Spirit falling on these Samaritans, what are they going to say? Hey, guys, God saved them just like he saved us. This is crazy radical. I know we may be yawning about it right now going, so what? But this is, this is a radical moment in church history. This is one of those blow your minds moments for the church. But this is the heart of the biblical gospel, that God wants people to follow Jesus. He wants people to experience forgiveness, to have eternal life, no matter their ethnicity, their tribe, their language, their politics, or how much money they have. Jesus died to save people. In fact, uh, when then the Apostle John looks in on the scene in Revelation chapter 5, where he sees the throne room of heaven, and they're singing to Jesus. They're, they're worshiping Jesus. You know what they sing? For you, Jesus, were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Isn't that amazing? This, this is what they, John heard the, you know, the angels, the four living creatures singing, Jesus, you ransom people with your blood for God from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. You know what that means? That means that, that God loves people. He doesn't love some people more than other people. He loves people. That means that God doesn't love American people more than Chinese people. It means that God doesn't love white people more than black people. It means that God doesn't love Republican people more than Democrat people. See, it's a shock to everybody. Now, now see, we can laugh, but it's a reality that we need to own. If we're going to be biblical people, if we're going to listen to God, if we're going to pay attention, now that he's got our attention, we need to understand that God loves people, period. No distinction between them. God's life-changing power is for everyone everywhere. And if the early church comprised completely of Jews who believed they and they alone were God's people, could understand this and own this and claim this, then every one of us needs to do the same. God wants to save people. Not just your people, but all people. Are we going to be a part of that? He did it in Samaria, freaked them out, but he showed his power of life change there. So God's life-changing power is for everyone everywhere. And, and then I want you to see that we cannot appropriate God's power for personal gain. Uh, the story gets weirder. Okay, so I'm just telling you. Verse 18, now when Simon, the magician, saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to, the, to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Okay, so let's go back to this point. We cannot appropriate God's power for personal gain. Now, Simon the magician tried to purchase the power of God, and he received a stern rebuke from Peter, and then he quickly repented. Okay, so he, he, he tried to do something foolish, and he got rebuked, and, and uh, he repented really quickly. And I'm thinking, 
First time I read that, you're like, how crass, how simple, how naive, how foolish of Simon the Magician to try that. And then I realized we can be just like Simon the Magician. I mean, we may not be that blunt, but we can be a, a, a lot like him because we often want God's power to make us healthy or attain riches or to be successful. There's a lot of times that we're more enamored with God's power than with God himself. And we want God to give us that access to his power. By the way, God is not opposed to your health, your wealth, or your success. It just isn't his goal. It's not what he's occupied with. It's not what's on his heart. He wants to redeem people's lives. And and here's where we get in trouble. If we try to manipulate God or his blessings, it won't work. We just need to repent quickly. And yet, how many of us have tried to bargain with God? How many of us have played, let's make a deal with God? God, if you do this, I'll do this. God, if you'll answer this prayer, then I'll do all these things. God, if you'll just, and and that's bargaining. That's trying to manipulate God. Look, God isn't for sale and he doesn't bargain. In case you missed this, he's God, we're not. He's master, we're servants. He's the one who has all power, we have zero power. In fact, all the power that we have is the power he gives us. So what are we doing trying to bargain? What are you doing trying to manipulate? Here's the truth. God's blessings follow obedience. Let me say that again. God's blessings follow obedience. If you obey God, if you commit to his mission, you're going to live in his blessings. They may not be the blessings that you're secretly craving in your heart, but God's going to bless you. But if we try to control or manipulate God, just like Simon, we're going to fail. Final truth. I'm going to share this with you. The gospel results in joy. Okay, go back to verse 8. Right after they believed and and people were being healed, it says there was much joy in that city. The gospel spread to that city. They heard the good news. They responded, and they had lots of joy. Look, the spread of COVID has resulted in fear and sickness and death and despair. None of us like that. But the spread of the gospel results in joy. Joy, Because when we experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus, when we understand that our sins actually are forgiven, then when we understand that God loves us and nothing we do can separate us from the love of God, when we understand that, that heaven is our destiny, even though we deserve hell, then we cannot help but rejoice. We cannot help but sing of the goodness of God. And and I just want you to see that joy and gratitude are natural consequences of knowing and following Jesus. Let me say that again. Joy and gratitude are natural consequences of knowing and following Jesus. And some of you are asking, then why are so many Christians angry, ungrateful, and mean? I wonder that myself. I grew up in churches where there were a lot of angry Christians. A lot of people were mean to each other, judged each other. Uh, Joy and gratitude were not the norm. They were not the culture of the churches. And looking back on it, I go, why? I I think the reason is tied to the story, what we just saw. The reason is we're focused on the wrong thing. We're trying to get what we want from God. We approach the relationship with Jesus like religion. We're trying to get what we want from God. So God, I want you to save me. What do I have to do? What hoops do I have to jump through so I get eternal life? Okay, God, uh, I I want you to uh, forgive me, so what do I need to do? Okay, God, I want you to bless me, so what do I have to do? Okay, God, I want you to heal me, what do I have to do? And we're trying to get something from God rather than enjoy the person of Jesus. Uh, So instead of trying to be obedient servants, we try to get what we want. Uh, You see, what God's calling us to do, what what, what ends up with joy in our lives is when we simply embrace the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and we live as obedient servants no matter the results, no matter the circumstances. So here's the question. Are you willing to obey Jesus regardless of outcomes? 
Are you willing to obey Jesus? Because this is where joy is going to be found. When you just go ahead and get to that point, you go, okay, Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to obey you. No matter what happens, we obey Jesus even if you're poor. We obey Jesus even if you're sick. Will you, will you obey Jesus even if your candidate loses? Or are you still trying to hold on to that whole, God, I want you to do this, and I need you to do that, and this is what I'm holding on to? See, this is a question about your relationship with God, because if good news is in our hearts, we're going to rejoice no matter what. Because we know that our Savior wins, and we belong to Him. See, I choose joy. I don't know what you're going to choose, but I choose obedience. I choose the mission of Jesus, and I'm going to trust God with the outcomes. I'm going to trust God with the blessings that he decides to give because it's a much more pleasurable and powerful way to live. Uh, the gospel results in joy. Does your life demonstrate the gospel? Will you pray with me? Father, you are good. And, and we want to do much more than just sing about your goodness. We want to do much more than just praise you with our lips. We want to live our lives for you. So we ask that you would meet us in this place, where, whether we're worshiping uh, on site or whether we're worshiping online. God, meet us right now and speak truth into our hearts. Let us hear your voice clearly. And God, we want to follow you no matter the outcomes. We want to stop trying to control what you're doing in our lives and just simply embrace you, embrace your truth, and live it. So God, right now, speak conviction into our lives. Because we, you know how hard-hearted we are and how single-minded we are and how we want what we want. God, right now, we just want to submit to you. Acknowledging that you are the Savior, acknowledging that you are the Master, acknowledging that, that we want to live for you. So change us. Help those that, that have not yet embraced you as Savior to do that right now. Father, for those that are living in rebellion right now, let them just come home. Let them find the grace and the mercy of, of coming back and saying sorry. Father, for those that have just been ignoring you, you've got our attention. And we want to hear from you. Because you are our Savior and Lord, and we yield. In Jesus' name, amen.